Honorable Ministers of Government, Professor Julian Kenny, other ministers present on the head table and off, Mr. Singh, Managing Director, CEO of the EMA, other members of boards of the various uh, state companies, members of the EMA, chairpersons of government agencies, directors and heads, there are so many distinguished persons here today, keynote speakers and panelists, specially invited guests, members of the media, distinguished ladies and gentlemen all. It is with pleasure that I stand before you today to address you, speak with you, at what is undoubtedly a very commendable effort of the Environmental Management Authority to promote the worthy cause of environment and economic cooperation. And I understand uh, Professor <clears throat> pointed out that uh, this is the first ever such forum in Trinidad and Tobago. So I would ask you to put your hands together, congratulate the Ministry of the Environment and of course the EMA. The theme of your forum reminds me of some words of former British Prime Minister Tony Blair. He once admitted that while in office, and I quote his words, the blunt truth about the politics of climate change is that no country will want to sacrifice its economy in order to meet this challenge. But all economies know that the only sensible long-term way of developing is to do it on a sustainable basis." End of quote. I repeat this, uh, his words to you this morning because it is my respectful view that these words are very reflective of the current global reality and definitely of the reality here in Trinidad and Tobago. And that reality is that in times of economic crunch, which our government has inherited, in times when we are in the process of implementing policies and projects to revive our economy and strengthen our delivery of viable economic returns for citizens, we simply cannot impede progress in the name of environmental action, which is little for the environment and even less for our people. But instead, we should make a very conscious effort to look at the environment as an economic opportunity. And as we look for this opportunity, economic opportunity in the environment, we should always bear in mind that while our key focus is on ensuring that our countries return to economic prosperity and stabilization, that does not mean that we cannot be guided by the idea of a social conscience in our work. And in so doing, we must recognize that we can do our bit for the environment and by extension the benefit of our society by running our businesses and making our policies in a socially responsible way which will promote respect for environmental issues. Only then can we rest assured that we would have done our utmost best for not only our country but of course for our future generations. Permit me to, to speak to you a bit on the work of the EME and the Ministry of the Environment. That is why today's forum is, as I've said, a very important, commendable effort on the part of the EMA and the Ministry of the Environment. I advise that your forum is aimed at cultivating positive attitudes and action towards the greening of business operations and services with the primary hope of developing viable options for a greener economy for Trinidad and Tobago. I'm advised to the forum is born out of the realization that there is tremendous opportunity in our country for green business and investment in a green economy, which will contribute to not only our economic security, but also to our environment and so social sustainability. And so it is our hope from this forum, the forum will engage all sectors in developing a way forward for green business, promote networking on green initiatives among stakeholders in the business sector, thirdly, streamline business strategies with government's plans as outlined in the budget statement of 2011, and fourthly, provide opportunities for green business growth as a niche market in Trinidad and Tobago. All I can say is that the success of these very noble aims will truly benefit TNT, and not only in terms of the economic stimulation and diversification that we need so badly right now. Because you see, we live in a period when the global economic downturn of the past few years has caused a stagnancy of traditional business practices coupled with slow consumer spending due to rising unemployment. These circumstances have mandated many developed countries 
devise new ways of injecting vibrancy back into their economies. The way most of them have decided to go is via green business, and indeed, many of you would know that U.S. President Barack Obama's stimulus package focused heavily on green growth, which saw 71 billion U.S. dollars being targeted on sustainable energy and environmental incentives, and $20 billion on green tax incentives. I do know that the Minister of the Environment has, what is it, $2 billion in the Green Fund, because it was not applied. We needed legislation, and we did, in fact, thank you, we did, in fact, uh, bring that legislation to Parliament. But we speak a little more on that. So the U.S. went with these stimulus packages in, in, um, in green business. Korea recently launched its Green New Deal, which was designed to create close to one million green jobs via investing in local green projects. Turkey, in a bid to boost local employment, has invested in domestic wind turbine factories for local and export use. <coughs> Excuse me, but perhaps the most ambitious is Mazda City in oil-rich Abu, Abu Dhabi, where they are building the world's first carbon neutral city free of cars and skyscrapers, and fully powered by renewable energy. Trinidad and Tobago must follow these examples if we are to emerge with a strong economy, but more important, a diversified economy which will ensure simultaneously that our environment is well protected and preserved for future generations, especially given our very historic dependence on the oil and gas sector. It is imperative that we achieve this goal given our government's commitment to ensuring that we achieve as a matter of policy and priority the UN MDGs. The eight goals, <coughs> excuse me, uh, may I have some water please? <coughs> this is um, coming out from the cold, back into the warmth. <laughs> it leaves you with, um, with, with whatever is in my throat. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm saying that the eight MDGs, which include eradication of extreme poverty and hunger, universal primary education, promotion of gender equality and empowerment of women, reducing child mortality, improvement of maternal health, combating HIV, AIDS, malaria, and other diseases, and ensuring environmental sustainability and the development of a global partnership for sustainability, development and sustainability. I can say without fear of contradiction that we as a nation, we have made considerable advances towards some of these goals over the years. You recall that in uh, 2000 we moved into universal secondary education. We already have universal primary education. And in this five year period, four, what do we have now? Um, just over four year period left. Our goal is to move into universal preschool education, and we would have well satisfied those Millennium Development Goals. May I share with you um, a very interesting statistic as I depart from my text for a moment? Um, on Commonwealth Day, when I was in, in London, the Commonwealth Secretary had released a study, research uh, that they had done, and in that study, they examined the 54 nations of the Commonwealth to see which were the best nations to grow up in, which were the best countries for girls to grow up in. The theme this year was uh, women as agents of change and the empowerment of women and girls at the heart of that theme. And um, on that very day, the research was released. And you'll be very happy to know New Zealand was first, Barbados was second, Trinidad and Tobago was third, Dominica was fourth, and um, within uh, Within the, the top 23, the first 23, 11 of the nations were Caribbean nations. So we're doing very well in Trinidad and Tobago and in the region as a whole. And one of the, the, the factors they were looking at in, in assessing best place to grow up as a girl had to do with education. And that's why I feel very happy that we had a part to play in that when we introduced that uh, universal secondary education in the year 2000. And 10 years later, we are reaping some of the benefits of that um, being placed as third in the 54 nations of the Commonwealth. So I was speaking about the MDG goals and um, the fact about education and uh, uh, sustainability. We have made strides, but I know that there's a lot that we still have to do, much more to achieve. 
And if there is one goal in which focused attention must be given, it is the area of environmental sustainability and performance in which our achievements have been less than satisfactory. We were fortunate, um, we were fortunate last year that um, change came to this country that allowed us to put a stop to the smelters or else we would have been in a very serious uh, situation environmentally as many of you keen about the environment uh, would have lobbied um, last year to ensure that that did not happen. Um, Minister Carolyn C. Prasad Bation um, came into the cabinet very early o'clock in the new cabinet to um, put into effect the promise we had made in our conversations to stop the smelters. And if we look at the internationally documented, widely accepted environmental sustainability index and its later derivative, the Environmental Performance Index, EPI. These indices were developed by Yale University, the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy, and Columbia University, their Center for International Earth Science Information Network, in collaboration with the World Economic Forum and the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. But as I have a captive audience here, if you'll permit me once again to invite those of you who might be interested in attending with us to Brazil later in April, um, Minister of Trade and Minister of Energy will provide the information. Um, whilst we were again in, in, um, in London, we met with British Gas. They intend to invest $30 billion into Brazil within the next five years. And they have offered and they've asked Trinidad and Tobago to partner with them in Brazil. Um, all the services in their oil and gas industry, all the services from the start to the finish, they are very happy to partner with Trinidad and Tobago to provide a doorway for us into Brazil. And so I'll take this opportunity, as so many of our state board chairmen are here, um, to invite those of you to accompany us with a trade delegation to Brazil uh, later this year. Tremendous opportunities await us there. Um, British Gas, the Vice President, flew from Brazil to, to meet me in London to put this proposal to us because they say we have that expertise. In oil and gas, we've had it from 100 years upwards. They've partnered with Trinidad and Tobago right here and elsewhere, and that they trust uh, the expertise of the treaties. Um, I think it's a great opportunity. I want you to keep it in your minds and more information will be forthcoming. There isn't a lot of time, but I do believe it is something our businesses here, our supply businesses can explore. I see Mr. Kelvin Ramnath is here. I'm sure he's very much familiar with what we are speaking of, the great expertise at our companies here in the oil and in the energy sector as a whole. So we're speaking about uh, <clears throat> these indices uh, being developed. And the EPI compares uh, nations on 25 metrics, including environmental health, air quality, water resource management, biodiversity and habitat, forestry, fisheries, agriculture, and climate change. And I recall uh, Dr. Murilal, when we were in the parliament, I think Mr. Ramnath would also remember, Mr. Ganga Singh, you all will remember, we, were, we used to batter these statistics <laughs> in the parliament, the EPI, the indices, uh, as to what they were saying about Trinidad and Tobago. In the latest EPI index, our country scores are very poorly, with a performance index of 54.2, a ranking of 103 in the 163 countries assessed by the Lane Yale Consortium. So we are at 103 out of 163, very low down, of course, in terms of the EPI index, which has caused, I'm sure, Professor Kenny for concern and for alarm. Perhaps a more worrisome aspect of our rating in the revelation of our position amongst countries in the Western Hemisphere, especially as our GNP is higher than most of these countries, we are ranked near the bottom at number 23 of 26 countries in the hemisphere, Western Hemisphere. Without apportioning blame to anyone, I want to point out that these scores were achieved over the last decade, and indeed it falls on this government to right this wrong. We are fully committed to do so. To not do so means that we will continue to produce generations of children, among whom asthma will continue to be a main problem. To not do so means we will continue to have a country where a prevalent problem during the dry season, bushfires, and a country where our fish stock will continue to decline. There are many factors responsible for these and the many more environmental hazards which continue to plague our country. 
Perhaps the central influence has been the nature of our economy based on oil and gas, which has given us the resources to address some of the goals, at the same time as it has given citizens unprecedented purchasing powers, which has led to widespread consumerism and its negative effects. But we are here today not simply to recite a litany of woes, but rather to make the first positive steps towards greening of our country, greening of our economy, identifying the problems and many practical ways in which we address and solve them, an objective that has been shared in most societies, developing and <clears throat> developed countries as well. Some of the key components I'm advised are the process of greening of any economy revolve around water and energy. In a truly green economy, water is highly managed through watershed management and water reclamation and reuse. Fossil fuel consumption is drastically reduced or even eliminated where practicable and alternative renewable energy sources are employed. Land and marine living resources are carefully managed with priority given to conservation of forests and wetlands, coastal areas and waters, agricultural lands, and with restoration of all degraded areas. Transportation uses, uses alternative fuels and is largely through public transit systems. You will note that many of these we are very deficient in, in all of these areas. There is much recycling of solid waste, less wasteful packaging, and more effective solid waste disposal again an area in which we are sadly lacking. Finally, all human habitation buildings, including public structures and spaces, are designed to improve energy efficiency. And may I, may I say, I was advised um, yesterday, and perhaps the ministers can, can confirm or deny, um, I was advised that in all our public buildings, that if we are replacing air conditioners or we are outfitting new buildings with air conditioners, we would want to use what is known as the inverters. My message is this so that they, you can drop your energy consumption by, what is it, 15 to 20 percent. So all of you in these state companies, when you're going to look for air conditioners, please look for the inverters, whatever they are. I think Toshiba has some. I'm not advertising for them. Um, but I think there's three companies I was told, huh? three companies that uh, uh, provide these. Um, I, I have found that the government buildings are so cold, uh, Minister which you remember that we walk into these buildings and it's like we want to have the coldest uh, building. It means that we are wasteful energy use. But I come back to the, the issue of um, using the inverters if you are doing replacements or outfitting any buildings. Um, so in terms of uh, cutting down on <clears throat> energy use. So I'm saying we should, all our buildings, including public structures, spaces, designed to be more energy efficient. All green areas and built areas be preserved. Of the several approaches to greening mechanisms, I am told that water management and energy efficiency are very important. I mentioned that before. Managing water resources of any country, in theory, generally involves protection of watersheds and other sources of water, where natural water discharge, especially storm water, is managed so as to minimize flooding, another area where we have problems with, where there's the development of a distribution system to minimize and even eliminate loss, and where wastewater is treated and recycled. Many countries, especially those in drier climates, are seriously challenged and have to resort to very costly desalination, and that is a net carbon emitting process. Our country should not really need a desal plant, even as we are heavily industrialized, nor should a high-quality water produced at a new sewage treatment plant in Port of Spain continue to flow into the Gulf of Paria as some useless waste product, valueless product. It might surprise most to learn that the average rainfall of the United Kingdom is about the same as that of the drier parts of Trinidad, Shaka Shakari, and Ikakas. Perhaps one of the greater crises in the world today is the broad and complicated energy crisis. The recent events in Japan have added to widespread unease about nuclear energy, which was once thought to be a practical alternative, even to the point of countries such as Germany reviewing nuclear energy policies. Japan and countries such as France rely to a considerable extent on such energy sources. This is understand understandable 
Given international concerns about the effects of consumption of fossil fuels, the coal, the oil, the natural gas, on global warming and on climate change. Everywhere there have been initiatives to employ alternative sources of energy. Everywhere there have been moves to improve energy efficiency of consumer durables, from appliances to cars and public buildings, dwellings and even aircraft and shipping. More efficient energy use inevitably means savings for the user and on the wider scene, of course, lower carbon emissions. Our economy is and will continue to be for some time an oil and gas base, and that basically means we are a carbon-based uh, economy, and that will continue for quite some time. This doesn't mean that we cannot at the same time pursue strategies to increase energy efficiency or use alternative sources. In the background looms that unsustainable annual fuel subsidy of over $2 billion dollars fuel subsidy of $2 billion, and I want to make it very clear, I'm not saying I'm taking away the subsidy. Every time we mention the subsidy, somebody jumps up and say, don't take away the subsidy. But there will be ways in which you can reduce that subsidy. There are ways. And so one way is to improve energy efficiency. As a first step, the Ministry of Housing and Environment is incorporating in new housing developments designs for energy conservation, the use of solar water heating, and solar energy street lighting. These technologies are already well developed. The Ministry of Energy, while its main responsibility is managing exploitation of fossil energy resources, is also examining the wider use of solar and wind energy. Elsewhere, such resources are extensively employed in electricity generation for the national distribution system. One alternative energy source being considered is ocean current electricity generation a technology which has evolved from tidal energy technology, but it is still in the non-commercial experimental stage. Both our islands, Trinidad and Tobago, are situated in the path of major ocean, major ocean currents with an enormous potential for energy generation. But let us turn now to look at the very broad goal of our environmental sustainability. It can be only achieved through a partnership between the diversity of interests and stakeholders working within a well-ordered body of legislation that is a legal framework. We have inherited a surprisingly large and diverse body of legislative instruments, much of which is obsolete and unenforced. We intend to correct these problems and consequently I remind participants that one priority must be for upgrade of our planning laws as stated in our manifesto by relaying and debating the planning and development of land bill. Professor, you, you recall that bill, don't you? <laughs> and so we will bring this back onto the table and debate that planning and development of land bill, a bill that was developed through three different administrations over a period of 15 years and just cannot see the light of day. So we will bring it back on, Professor, and I'm sure you'll be willing to take a look at it again to um, update it and modernize it. Green development has at its core requirements for modern planning law that takes into account the environment and its varied services to humanity, citizen awareness and compliance with law and effective enforcement. The present planning law, the Town and Country Planning Act, is an obsolete relic of our colonial past that must be replaced with law that may not easily be subverted by expediencies of the day, a law that seeks to guide orderly physical development, and above all, law that is understood by citizens. <clears throat> At all times, there must be public participation in planning, but this is not the only legislative undertaking. Everyone is aware of the diversity of the negative effects of beverage containers. It is our intention to bring to Parliament in this session a beverage containers bill to address this particular issue. You would have seen some of you, um, you, know, you know it and you see it sometimes, but I remember when the flooding, all the flooding last year, and we went out, you would see every river, every drain, every canal, totally, totally, totally filled with beverage containers, um, soft drink bottles and uh, um, water and, yeah. It is amazing how much of it you see. And um, Kelvin will tell me those things are not biodegradable, so they're forever there. 
So it is something we intend to address by bringing the Beverage Container Bill to Parliament. And we also add it's our intention to reverse the decision of the previous administration that in effect deregulated non-metallic mineral mining and land clearance, the source of so much watershed destruction and the extreme costs of remediation that must be borne often by successive generations that we will reverse the decision of the previous administration to that effect. I refer specifically to amendments to the Certificate of Environmental Clearance Rules. Now, we have, have we not heard and understood the alarm about a growing noise pollution problem, poor quality air, traffic congestion, and developing squalor in our towns and villages? While there has been, in effect, noise pollution legislation for the past 10 years, it is clear that it has not been effectively enforced while there has been considerable commercial expansion of noise generation entertainment events, often in residential areas. And so excessive noise pollution clearly violates the constitutional right of many citizens to that very basic right to enjoyment of their property, and it is something that must be addressed. The Minister of Housing and Environment, under whose ministry falls the EMA, has directed the authority to address this problem with urgency. And then we look at our natural environment. It's not only there for its protection, it is there for enjoyment, careful use, and above all, to maintain our link with nature of which we are part and of nature whose systems give us the foundation of our well-being. One area of economic development is a branch of that worldwide leisure industry. It's the growing ecotourism industry. Tobago already offers prime dive sites. <coughs> its Buku Reef and Lagoon, its main rich forest reserve, which form part of tourism offerings. In Trinidad, we have the Carney and the River Swamps, and a premier birding lodge at Ace Wright. Again in London, when I met Secretary General of the Commonwealth, his wife said to me, she says, I just want to come back to Trinidad and Tobago to see the birds. I said, which birds? She said, the birds at Ace Wright Lodge. So we do have, um, we do have these niche markets, uh, the people out there, that we need to have ecotourism, that thrust, integrated into a wider thrust, both for domestic and visiting tourists. We are therefore giving attention to drafting special umbrella legislation to create a National Parks and Recreation Authority, as we had promised in our manifesto, in our People's Manifesto. So again, I wish to remind all that legislation alone obviously is not the solution, nor is it ineffectual enforcement of obsolete law. Good law, when properly enforced, is to protect the interests of all, now and in the future, and surprisingly, to even pr protect the interests of the transgressor. In an ideal world, all stakeholders would voluntarily comply in the interests of all, and surely the good citizen, corporate or private, must appreciate this, and that we must always aim at ideals. This, in a sense, reflects the eighth millennium goal of partnership in the processes of social and economic development. There is another accepted pillar of our relationship with our environment, namely the broad initiative of sustainable development. I want to quote, whereas the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago is committed to developing a national strategy for sustainable development, being the balance of economic growth with environmentally sound practices in order to enhance the quality of life and meet the needs of present and future generations. I want to emphasize the words future generations. Um, persons that work in the environment always speak of a, of, um, a saying, there's a saying that is always, when you go to sustainable development uh, seminars and so on, you would hear them say, we do not own this earth. We inherited it from our forefathers. And all that we can do, and all that we have to do, and all that we must do, is that we hold it in trust for the future generations, for our children. And therefore, as trustees of this, what is it that we'll pass to the future generations? Very important for us that we understand it is not ours to match up, but it is ours to hold in trust and to keep, to pass on to future generations. In other words, we must act always in such a way as to avoid burdening succeeding generations with the cost of uncontrolled depletion of our natural resources and remediation of our excesses and thus give them a fair chance to meet their needs. Reflect for a moment 
on just one relatively small incident in a recent past, the lead slag contamination of an unplanned settlement at the Demarara Road near Arima. The highly toxic lead slag was a waste product of a battery lead recycling enterprise irresponsibly diverted to paving that settlement. Tragically, one child died of lead poisoning. Another was permanently brain damaged and 50 hospitalized. Treating children is traumatic and costly. Clean up toxic soil costs millions. And so I must ask, how much will the next generation have to pay to clean up our environment, be it natural or built? It brings me then to the point of our inheritance from earlier generations that I made to you. This is a heritage which we often take for granted. In many cases, we simply neglect it or abandon it. The oldest officially declared forest reserve in the Western Hemisphere, as you know, is the main rich reserve in Tobago. Many of our forest reserves were established in the 19th century, partly for watershed management and partly for production forestry, long before any citizen alive was, uh, today was born. Our botanic gardens have been there for almost 200 years. Hollis Reservoir, a major source of our water supplies, was built in colonial times. Our world-famous bird sanctuary in the Carney Swamp, a home for a national bird, was established well before our Declaration of Independence. Some of our buildings, notably the Red House, President's House, are over a century old and in a state of disrepair. The oldest public building is in Trinidad, sitting on a small offshore island, Nelson Island, with its role in peopling this country, were constructed shortly after British capture of that Spanish colony over 200 years ago. Even our Port of Spain jail was built in the early 19th century. Noted, noted artist uh, Casabon, over 150 years ago, painted a view of Port of Spain from the hills of Lamenti, in which the cathedral and the lighthouse are clearly identifiable. Why do I remind you of these? It is because so much has been left to us. So much has been left to us by a previous generation. And now, part of our duty is to pass these on to the next generation. I mention these to remind us of the past generations and the heritage they have left us. I imagine also that they must all have been thinking of their immediate needs in the same way that we do, rather than posterity. But they have nevertheless left us a heritage in the natural and built environments, a heritage that we have, create, we have treated rather casually, and a heritage that will be extremely costly to restore. <coughs> National heritage must never be a vague abstraction. It must be a binding force, a force to unify a nation in understanding the past and its lessons, in guiding the present generation, in continuing to build and conserve for the present, and one that creates that vision for the future which will distinguish our generation. And so, what will our generation leave for the next? That is the question we have to answer. To put it bluntly, we must not incur an environmental debt so large that it intolerably burdens the future generations of our land. And all that means is that we must all partner together, private and public sector. All citizens unite in a collective, tangible effort to ensure that we achieve a green economy and a better standard of environmental care and preservation of our nation. As I close, I say to you participants in this forum, you are experts within your respective areas of activity. But you are also members of several publics which constitute our nation. And I expect that all will be actively involved in the many discussions that will arise with one common goal, finding the appropriate formula for evolving a truly green Trinidad and Tobago. It will mean innovation, Commit and a commitment to positive change. It will ensure that the construction sector, for example, which works so closely with the Ministry of Housing and which fall under strong regulations from the EMA, that they will have to implement measures whereby energy efficiency should be on the priority list for all construction work and socially conscious members of this industry will be able to come up with energy efficient measures to help them to save money and, of course, to help us save the environment. It will mean adopting a business philosophy whereby entrepreneurs recognize the vital role they can play in combating climate change by realizing 
that there need not be any conflict between the environment and the economy, and finding a way not only to reconcile this, but also finding a way to new profits and new opportunities as they engage in environmentally and socially right practices. This forum is the very first footstep, and we must make in that transformation to the state where, as a nation, we, mo we know that we must shift our emphasis from economic efficiency and materialism towards a sustainable quality of life and to healing of our society, of our people, and of our systems. It is truly really the only way forward. And so I wish you success in your deliberations today in your forum and look forward to your findings at the end of the day and to reports coming out of this forum. I want to thank the Minister of Housing for inviting me to be with you this morning. And as I say, good luck in your deliberations. Thank you. May God continue to bless each and every one of you. And may God continue to bless our nation. Thank you.